All right, let's get started into chapter five. So in chapter four, we were really focused on thinking about solids and liquids and making solutions, and we really didn't talk a lot about gases. So in chapter five, we're focused on gases and thinking about how those are different than liquids and solids. <clears throat> Because gases are different than liquids and solids, and they're a lot less dense, we have to think about the different units that we're going to be focused on for this chapter and how those might be different than chapter four. So in chapter four, we use grams and moles, we use volume and molarity, and we're gonna still use volume and moles, but now we're gonna add two other units to think about what um, is important for gases and pressure is going to be one of those and temperature is the other. So we haven't really talked a lot about temperature before and in with gases it's going to be really important. So we'll talk about the simple gas laws and that's the focus of experiment seven. Then we'll also use the ideal gas law to solve for different variables related to a gas and this is also what we're doing in experiment eight. <clears throat> We'll also see how we can use the gas law to solve for other important quantities to better understand gases. We'll also go back to stoichiometry with mole ratios, stuff we learned in chapter four, to do different reactions or understand quantities of gases in a reaction. And then we'll understand some more of the theory behind how gas molecules move and how we understand their energy. So when we're talking about the gas state, because it's not very condensed, meaning the molecules are really far apart, we have to really think about different units to communicate how much stuff we have because mass becomes something that's a lot harder to measure. So we know that gases are much less dense than liquids or solids. We also know that mass is difficult to measure, so instead volume is used to measure quantity. And mass is easy to measure if you have a solid or a liquid, but it's much harder when you have a gas. So volume is used to measure quantities. We can do this pretty easily with gauges. Um, we can also do this easily using different types of glassware that we have. And we know that volume is something that's really highly affected by pressure as well as temperature. And this is something that you've probably experienced a lot in real life, especially given that in Wisconsin, it can be really cold or really warm. And so, <coughs> We've seen how temperature can really affect volume, especially in things like tire pressure. Another thing that's important about gases is that gases are miscible. So instead of thinking about will something dissolve in something else where we used our solubility chart, we don't really care with gases because we can just say that they can be mixed together in any proportion and they will just hang out next to each other and be in the same container, with the exception being if they react with each other. But otherwise, you can mix up two gases and they will both coexist in the same container. The other thing we know about gas atoms of gases or molecules of gases when they are in the gas state, they are relatively far apart. And so they don't interact very much with each other. Also, something being a gas is often a lot more important for predicting its properties than other identities that it has. So we say that gases have similar properties, again, just because they are gases, and this is independent of their chemical identity. So again, being in the gas state is what predicts a lot of the properties. 
So we're going to be talking about four important variables in this chapter. We're going to be using volume, V, and the main unit for volume that we'll be using in this chapter is the liter. We have pressure, which is abbreviated as P, and the main unit that we're thinking about for pressure is atmospheres, but we'll talk about some of the other units. We're also interested in temperature, and that's going to have units of Kelvin. Oops, sorry. Temperature is abbreviated as T, and the unit for temperature will be Kelvin. And the last thing we're interested in is moles, which is abbreviated as N. I'm not sure why it's not M. I think it's because little m means a different concentration unit, so we're going to use N and the unit is just moles, so there's nothing complicated there. So let's discuss pressure, because pressure is something that we haven't really mentioned very much at all. We know about temperature, we know about volume, we know about moles, but pressure is a relatively new variable for us in Chem 103. So let's talk about where that comes from. If you've taken a physics class, you know that pressure is the force exerted over a certain area. When we're thinking about that in terms of gases, we're thinking about the gas molecules in a sample exerting a force on the walls of the container because the gas molecules are in constant motion. We can think about them inside of a container, right? moving around and just hitting the walls of a container, no matter which direction they're going. And every time they collide with the container, it exerts a force. So because we exist on Earth, and Earth has an atmosphere, we have what's called atmospheric pressure. So the atmosphere on Earth is composed of a bunch of gases, and they all exert a force onto Earth's atmosphere. And we know this because this greatly impacts different weather patterns. And so our atmosphere is a mixture of gases. The main one is nitrogen, which makes up about 78% of all of the atmosphere. We also have a bunch of oxygen, critical for our survival. We all know there's also a bunch of CO2, which is actually a relatively small part of the atmosphere, although quite problematic. And we also have argon, which a lot of folks are not familiar with. But there are smaller quantities of other gases, although these are the ones that make up most of the atmosphere. The percentage of each one will vary depending on where you're at on Earth, so specifically your altitude, but also what the weather is in a particular area. And we know that at sea level, the standard pressure is equal to one atmosphere. So if you go higher in altitude, the pressure gets lower. If you get lower in altitude, the pressure is larger. So let's talk about the different units of pressure that we have. So I mentioned that we have one atmosphere as the main unit that we talked about because that's the pressure at sea level and it's easy to define because it's just the number one. But there are other units that you'll encounter in this chapter. Millimeters of mercury, which is also commonly used for weather. Bar is another one. Pascals is more common in physics, and pounds per square inch, or PSI, we all know is used for pressure and things like tires. So how are these all related to each other? Well, one atmosphere is 760 millimeters of mercury. It is also 760 torr. It is also 1.01325 times 10 to the fifth pascals or 101.325 kilopascals, or, oops, 14.7 PSI, or 1.0133 bar. And all of these, oops, bar is only one R. All of these have only, or are available to you on your orange sheet. 
So this is not something that you need to memorize. It's on your equation sheet. So all you would have to do is look at that and um, you would have all of these conversion factors there. So if I can bring up your equation sheet, hmm, I probably can't because I'm bad at technology. Yeah, anyway, oh, Chem 103 equation sheet, look at us. So now we're thinking about this portion of our equation sheet. So these conversions and equations are gonna be the ones that we're using for exam three because exam three only covers chapter five. So it's a relatively nice short one for us to look at. All right, let's keep talking about pressure. So with pressure, when we measure pressure, we use what's called a barometer. And a barometer is basically a mercury, uh, is a glass tube. It's full of mercury. And um, when the air pressure pushes down on the mercury on the outside, it's forced up this tube. And the height of the mercury tells us the atmospheric pressure on a given day. So, Again, it's mercury, which is Hg, and it's forced into a tube by atmospheric pressure. And this is actually the exact same way that a straw works. So if you've ever tried to use a straw um, without a hole in your container. So you need a, always a secondary hole because otherwise when you suck on the straw, what you're doing is you're pulling a vacuum. And so you're not actually sucking up the liquid. What you're doing is creating a vacuum in the straw so that the atmospheric pressure can push down on the liquid and force it to equalize the pressure and that makes the liquid go up the straw. If you don't have a hole other than the one you're drinking out of in your cup or in your straw or whatever, then it's not gonna go up into the straw. All right, so it's a similar idea for this barometer. And what happens is, again, the height of our tube tells us the atmospheric pressure. And the reason why we use mercury is because even though it's extremely toxic, it's also very dense. And because it's so dense, right, it has a density of 13.6 grams per mil. If we compare that to water, which has a density of one gram per mil, you can see how you can use a lot less liquid in your mercury than you would if you had a column of water. So you'd actually need a very, very tall column, right? 13.6 feet versus one foot if you used water. And this was developed by Marco Torricelli, and that's why the tor is one of our units for pressure. What do we know about gases when we're thinking about gases, not just in terms of pressure, but in terms of how they move, is that we can use the pressure to think about what gases are doing. So gases move from areas of high pressure to areas of low pressure. And this is known as flow. And this has a huge impact on weather patterns. So this is a predictor of atmospheric conditions. The greater the difference in the pressure from one area to the next, the larger your flow will be. So larger pressure difference means you're going to have stronger gas flow. And when you have this kind of gas flow, what we experience in real life is wind or other stronger wind phenomenon like tornadoes or hurricanes. So we have all of our different variables that we mentioned at the start of this chapter. Our variables are 
pressure, temperature, moles, and volume. And so the simple gas laws allow us to relate all of the different variables to volume. So the first gas law is Boyle's law. And Boyle's law says that if you have a constant temperature, meaning the temperature doesn't change, and you also don't change the number of moles, then we know that V is proportional to one over the pressure. And so we write the gas law as P1V1 equals P2V2. So what that means is if you double your pressure, then your volume goes down by half and vice versa. Let's say you triple your volume. If you triple, triple your volume, then the pressure is now a third of what it is originally. Pressure is one third. And so these are inversely related to each other. As one goes up, the other goes down by the same factor. Charles' law tells us that at constant pressure and number of moles, volume is directly proportional to the temperature. So as one goes up, the other goes up. If one goes down, the other goes down. So in this picture, what we're looking at is liquid nitrogen being poured on a balloon and it's very, very cold. So as we pour the very cold liquid nitrogen on the balloon, it deflates. So temperature went down, the volume went down. When we came back up to room temperature, you can see that the volume also came back up. But when we're writing an equation for this or solving for a temperature or a volume, the temperature must be in units of Kelvin. And we introduced this in chapter one, and we said that the Kelvin temperature is just the Celsius temperature plus 273.15. So if your temperature is in Celsius, you'll still have a relationship, but it's not a linear relationship. And so what this tells us is that if T doubles, then V doubles. And if T goes down by a half, then the same thing will happen to your volume. And the last gas law that we're thinking about is Avogadro's law. And so Avogadro, I'm sure you remember, has to do with moles. And this law says that at constant pressure and temperature, volume is directly proportional to the number of moles. So we can write V1 over N1 is V2 over N2. And this tells us that when N doubles, then the volume, oh goodness, the volume doubles as well. Okay, not really sure why I'm struggling here, but N doubles, V doubles. And if N is halved, then V is halved. So it's the same relationship that we saw with Charles's law, but this one has to do with moles. And this makes sense, right? If you have more stuff in a balloon, it should get larger. If you have less stuff in a balloon, it should get smaller. And so this is the subject of experiment seven, and you are going to be deriving these gas laws in experiment seven. And then we'll be able to put all these together to think about the ideal gas law.